I love the series. I love the idea of community, how we live out community, this idea of friends becoming family, family. I'm going to stutter over that so many times this sermon, just so you know. Family, but I love it because community has formed me outside of the love and grace and mercy and restorative power of God, of God, praise the Lord and the Holy Spirit. Community is what has formed me and shaped me and made me who I am today. So I'm very excited to be here with you. And I believe that we are saved into a community. When we say yes to Jesus, we're also saying yes to the family of, of believers. Amen. And so I'm very excited to be here with you this morning. Uh, before we jump in, I do want to acknowledge there's a couple different groups in the room, right? There's those of you that call Canvas home. And you're like, this is it for me. I'm serving. I'm in the groups. I'm doing the thing. Thank you. We're so glad that you're here. I hope by the end of the sermon that you'll be able to have even more tangible application of what it can look like to live faithfully in community here. I'm so glad you're here. Two, if there's, um, there's a group in the room that maybe they're flirting with Canvas <laughs> and they're like, maybe this is for me. I don't know. Go to Belong Night on Wednesday, okay? <laughs> Sign up for Belong Night. See what it's all about. And then, um, and then put in roots, whether it's here or somewhere else. Hopefully it's here. Put in roots here. Go to Belong Night. Amen? But I also would say that maybe you don't identify as a Christian. Maybe you kind of wandered in today. Maybe it was the first time that you've been to church ever or in years. Uh, I want to say welcome. I'm so glad that you're here. Um, this is a little invitation today to like take a peek behind closed doors of the church of being like, oh, this is what the teachings of the Bible has to say about community. This is how we're supposed to show up um, in community. So I want to invite you to take a little peek into the practices of community in a church context today, okay? So my husband and I are, are celebrating seven years tomorrow. I know, seven years of marriage, yeah. Um, but we had to, before we made that covenant relationship commitment, had to take a peek behind the doors of the family dynamics, right? So this is an invitation to you today. So glad that all of you are here. And if you're like, I don't identify with any of those groups, welcome. We're so glad that you're here too. Um, but yes, so... Out of curiosity, as we transition into the, the bulk of the text, do we have any Ted Lasso fans here? Woo! Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, Ted Lasso, we're here. Great. So for those, who, those of you that are not Ted Lasso fans, here's a little bit, without spoilers, no spoilers, don't worry, of the, the theme of Ted Lasso, essentially... It is a show about a soccer club in England that has had a lot of turmoil, uh, really toxic leadership, really toxic culture. And it starts from like the top leaders all the way down to the players that are on the ground, uh, just really toxic culture. And they hired this new unexpected coach who does things in a very uh, non-traditional soccer clubby way, okay? Ted Lasso. Um, and so th there's different things that happen throughout the seasons, but there's this, this episode in season two uh, about Christmas. And it's kind of the, standalone, the only standalone episode in the entire series. It's like a beloved, ev like everyone that loves Ted Lasso watches this, show, this particular episode at Christmas. Am I right? Yeah. Ted Lasso fans? Okay, cool. Um, and it, it starts with um, them talking about what are their Christmas traditions. And the manager of the soccer club that has been around for a long time, he said, oh, well, we open up our Christmas presents, and then I have an open house for the international players who don't have family in town. Normally, one, maybe two players come. Um, and so he doesn't have a lot of hope for this like community, right? But he wants to be open and available for people to gather. And so as the episode progresses, they flash to him in his home, they're opening up presents as a family and all of a sudden the doorbell rings and players just start flocking inside that there's people from, that are coming from all over the world that come bearing food. They come bring what they have. They're bringing their tradition. They're bringing their culture and they play games and they do new traditions and they do all these things. And it ends with this spanned out picture of the table and Higgins, who is at the head of the table, he's the football or the soccer club manager. He gives this speech that there, like, there's always, always like tears whenever my husband and I watch it. We're like, this is the kingdom of God. <laughs> like, um, but they span out and he honors each of the players from the different representations around the world and what they brought to the table. And he says, thank you for sharing in our tradition. And I want to make a toast to the family we're born with and to the family we make along the way. 
we know, everyone knows that we are created for this kind of community, this kind of connection, right? Similarly, when Friends was pitched, again, playing off the Family Matters nostalgia, when, when Friends was pitched back in 1993, this is what it was pitched as. It's a show about friendship and that time in your life when you're young and you're living in the city and when everything is possible. It's that magical moment when your friends become family. So there's the world that is seeing that this is a desire of people's heart. They're trying to create it or manifest it or even capitalize on it, this value of friends that become family. And we, but the truth is, is that we're all created for this kind of connection. It's actually in our DNA, going back to the garden, going back to the creation, when God said, let us make them in our image, that we serve this, like this communal God. And so we are actually created. Before we were made, we were created to live in community. And so this is the good, that's good news, right? That we're actually created and called for this kind of connectedness and this kind of community. And that the body of believers provides that for us. The body of Christ like in the context of the church, the context of the community provides that for us. Amen? Oh, let's pray before we jump into the text. So God, we thank you so much that this was like, this is in our DNA to desire this, Lord. And we acknowledge that um, it can be hard living in community sometimes. It can be hard living this like sacrificial love. God, but I pray that you would remind people today as we start going through the text of, man, how loved we are by you, the grace, the forgiveness, the um, mercy that's been shown. And God, that we're not just told to like live in this way um, without the power of the Holy Spirit, but it's your spirit that enables us to live in this self-sacrificing, loving way in our communities, God. And we just declare that it's worth it. God, that there's like a heartache that we desire to be connected to people and we desire to be known um, and to be loved, fully known and fully loved, Lord. So thank you that that is true, that you know us, you love us, you created us, and Lord, let us be the people that practice that kind of generous love with each other. We love you. In your sense, we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so this morning, we are actually going to be in the book of Romans 12, um, because this is such a clear and direct passage on what love looks like worked out in a Christ-centered community, okay? Um, so we're going to land in Romans 12, specifically verse 10, but I want to give a little bit of the context of Romans 12 before we land in verse 10. Um, Romans 1 through 11 is a very like highly theological um, letter up from, what, from chapters 1 to 11. It talks about God's love, God's mercy. There's no condemnation for those that are in Christ. The power of the Spirit, there's nothing that can, you can do to separate you from, the, from God's love. Like, and so Paul really spells out, like, you are so loved. You have been shown so much mercy. And then he gets to verse 12, or chapter 12, where he says, therefore... And so if you're familiar with the Apostle Paul, you know when he says, therefore, you have to have a context of the first, what, before, what becomes before the therefore, because therefore is like, and this is what this looks like in practice. Does that make sense? Yeah. Amen? So that's where we're starting today in chapter 12, verse 1, um, and with the lens of like, okay, this is the practical application of this. We are so loved by God, so live in this way. And I think that it's interesting because actually the first thing that Paul does is that he spells out what it looks like to live in Christian community. That's the first thing on the top of his mind is like, okay, we are so loved by God. What does this mean? It's not do your quiet times at eight o'clock in the morning every morning, right? The things, it's not the checklist of like, oh, did I do this, this, and this thing? It's not that. It's this is what it looks like to live in community and intentionally love the community and the body of Christ that you're in. So, and I think that Paul starts here because he knows it's the most challenging thing, right? Am I right? All right, so I'm just gonna jump right in. Romans 12, verse one, therefore, and so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all that he has done for you. He loves you so much, so love others for all that he has done for you. Oh, I'm gonna add commentary, is that cool? Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, that's not actually in the text, that's just like <laughs> Gabby Alzate translation. Gabby Alzate translation, the gat. Okay, uh, so dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all that he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind that he will find accept acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him 
This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behaviors and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. If you guys were here last fall, they did a really, like, y'all did a really powerful sermon series on mind shift changing the way that you think. So this is kind of just a continuation of last fall, okay? Changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give you each this warning. Don't think you are better than you actually are. Ooh, Paul, coming in hot. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. Just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body and we all belong to each other. We all belong to each other. In his grace, God has given us different gifts. Praise God, different things, different gifts, different expressions of God's love for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out as much as, with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. Don't withhold. Each one of you have gifts deposited in you by God through the power of the Holy Spirit. When we come together, whether it's in our groups, whether it's in um, our activities, whether it's on a Sunday morning, show up with knowing that you have gifts to offer this community. Amen? Don't just pretend to love others, really love them. Hate what is wrong, hold tightly to what is good. This is the verse of the day. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope, be patient in trouble and keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them and always be eager to practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Amen? So the verse, be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. If you come to our apartment, um, this is the first thing that you'll see when you walk in the door. It is a map of San Francisco, and then flanking it, it is the Benedictine vow of stability. And this is what, and we, we intentionally, when we had our one bedroom, it was right there in the entrance. We want people to know this is what we're about. We're about San Francisco, and we're about the community. And then now it's like, there wasn't really a spot for it in our entryway. So it's right as it over our dinner table that this is the first thing you see. But this is what the Benedictine vow of stability says. We vow to remain all our life with our local community. We live together, pray together, work together, relax together. We give up the temptation to move from place to place in search of an ideal situation. Ultimately, there is no escape from oneself. And the idea that things would be better someplace else is usually an illusion. And when interpersonal conflicts arise, we have a great incentive to work things out and restore peace. This means learning the practices of love, acknowledging one's own offensive behavior, giving up one's preferences, forgiving. Learning the practices of love. You can keep that on the screen for a little bit because if you're taking notes, that's the outline, just so you know. Acknowledging one's own offensive behavior, giving up one's preferences, forgiving. I wanna emphasize that it is a learning process for everyone. You don't arrive at perfection in this. It is a constant learning and growing and humbly walking this out day in and day out in the context of community. It's interesting because uh, the Benedictine community um, formed this group of people back in 529 AD, so over 1,500 years ago, with this goal and idea that they were going to create community that was living for God together. 
That's what the goal was. And they created something that outlasted them. So I don't think that when they were creating this, they're like, 1,500 years from now, people are still going to model this. I don't think that they did. I think that they were just trying to be really faithful to each other, to the, to the call of God, to be in community together. And then they saw incredible things happen. So the Benedictines were known as pillars of justice in starting in 529, they were the first ones to create hospitals. They were the first ones to take care of the poor, like in a really radical way. The first ones to provide education. Like they did these like crazy things because they were committed to each other and committed to the thriving of a place. But they were known for pillars of justice, hospitality, generosity. That Like this is what they were known for. And I think that um, when you, not saying that we all need to become monks, right? Like maybe go for it, but like, I'm not saying that we all need to do that. But when you decide to vow to be something bigger than yourself, God takes that and he like multiplies it, right? And I think that last week when Rachel was here and she talked about uh, lifting each other's burdens or bearing each other's burdens, and she painted this picture of like, man, what would it look like if Christians in the body of Christ in San Francisco were known for this communal love and for lifting of burdens of each other, where no need goes unmet. It's we take care of the, the widow and the orphan and the immigrant and those that are most vulnerable in our city. What if we were known for that? How different would Christians be looked at in San Francisco go and beyond if we were known by practicing this radical love together, right? That's what the Benedictines were about. And so how did they do it? By learning and walking in the practices of love. Okay, drawing on a little bit of 90s nostalgia, you got to help me out here. What is love? Okay. Good job, good job. Much better than the 915. Good job, guys. <laughs> but there's so many different understandings of what love is. And if that's what the world says, that the baseline of love is not hurting each other, man, what a shallow version of what love is, right? But we're actually called to like such a deeper way of loving each other. And love has to look like something. And this is what love looks like in action is Romans 12 and these practices of love. So let's dive into it. Remembering that we're practicing together, right? Practicing, humbly walking together. And I'm preaching to myself right now. We, when I was preparing this, I like looked up at the wall and I was like, hmm, this is posted on my wall. And I don't have this memorized yet. That's sad. Like this, like this should be so written on my heart. Anyway, practice number one, acknowledging one's own offensive behavior. This is so countercultural to everything that we are taught, right? From... Um, our workplaces, from our family of origin, from some friendships that we might have had. Like, we've been taught from a really young age, whether directly or indirectly, to not acknowledge our offensive behavior, right? Where we do everything that we can to blame or project or to cover up. And I'm convinced it's because we're afraid. We're afraid of what will happen if people really find out. We're afraid of punishment. We're afraid of... Um, being alone, and we're taught this, again, whether directly or indirectly from a really young age. So part of my role at BJM is I work with very like small children, um, and there is a girl in our programs that she was maybe like five or six years old, uh, and we were playing, we used to have this women's center down on Ellis Street where it was like a living room, and then you would go through a door, and it was kind of like an art space in the back, um, and we were in the process of doing some art projects and... <laughs> God bless one of our interns. One of our interns left out a spray can, okay? So um, knowing that there were five and six-year-olds that were about to come, mm -hmm, God bless. Anyway, um, they came, the little, uh, little Amy, she is playing in the living room, and then she walked into the art studio, and all of a sudden, she's the only one back there, you hear, and then she comes back, and she goes, um, somebody sprayed that, <laughs> right? Like immediately her response was to cover up what she did, was to blame or project. She wasn't taught to do that, but she like instinctively knew like, oh no, if I'm found out, I'm going to get in trouble. I have to not like acknowledge my own, my own offensive behavior, my own uh, shortcomings. And so we're all kind of taught that 
directly or indirectly. And so to undo that learning that some of us maybe have been practicing that way for the last 20, 30 years of our lives, it's an intentional undoing uh, of covering up and acknowledging our own shortcomings and our own offensive behavior. I will say that recognition of this is a key to restoring relationships. When you're able to recognize and acknowledge your own offensive behavior in community, it opens, up conf- or it opens up conversation, it opens up empathy, and then people can connect. But we have to first acknowledge it first, right? And there will be inevitable conflict, just in general and community. To think that we're not gonna experience conflict just isn't really living reality. Yeah, exactly, it's not real. Um, but we do have to learn how to respond to the conflict, right? So when I was 20, I moved here. This was my introduction to San Francisco. I knew about Full House um, and that's it. The Golden Gate Bridge maybe because of Full House. So uh, I, moved, I came here to do a, disciple, a six month discipleship training school, which is this really intensive six months where you're learning about God, uh, learning about yourself, learning how to like faithfully live in the ways of Jesus. What I didn't realize is that I was going to be in a 250 square foot apartment with three other girls for six months in the tenderloin. (laughs) Didn't realize that. Um, All of a sudden, uh, your offensive behavior was in your face all the time, right? And their offensive behavior, but more looking at your own offensive behavior. So there's four of us that lived in this room. And then there was about 25 of us that shared one kitchen. And so... um, there's a lot, you, it was like looking into the mirror of your soul really quickly. So one day, um, it, yeah, one day I went and I got a Chipotle, a holy Chipotle bur- burrito, right? Uh, when you got to go out to eat, it was like the biggest blessing. So I went to Chipotle and I got this burrito. And have you guys ever heard of this um, house rule, no name fair game? Mm, okay, yes, it's exactly what you think about it. If you have food and you put it in the refrigerator and there is no name on it, it is fair game for anyone to eat. So I did not make that mistake. I, I was rationing my food because I didn't have a lot of financial wherewithal. And so I ate half of it and I like foiled it up, Gabby. I even put it in the back of the refrigerator to make sure nobody would eat it. It was like the first grabbable thing. So next day, go downstairs, um, go downstairs to the kitchen and my burrito is gone. I was so angry. Like, you know when you get to like a tipping point and you're like, this is the thing. <laughs> like the, the burrito was the thing. So I was so mad, like ranted about everyone, uh, about everything. And then I went to the kitchen manager. and I was like, the kitchen manager, like you owe me an apology. I spent money on this. This system is broken. This is st-. like, kind of went off. And he was like, ah, oh, I'm sorry. And I was like, ah, whatever. So anyway, <sighs> calmed down, took a walk, whatever. A couple of weeks went by, I go into my office or into the little office area. Wouldn't you know it? There was a burrito, a half a burrito with Gabby on it and a little sticky note that said, we found this in the fridge. <laughs> uh-huh. So with humility, I went to several different people and I was like, hey, I'm so sorry I gave you, I I was afraid to do this though because I was so embarrassed. It was embarrassing for me. So I went to the people though and I was like, hey, um, I'm really sorry. Like the burrito was there, I missed it. Um, And you know, everyone like was like, oh, I forgive you. Like I haven't thought about this burrito in weeks. I went to the kitchen manager. I said, hey, I really missed it. I'm really sorry. And he said, I love you. I forgive you. And what sticks out in my mind about this story is because I think it was the first time in my life that I hadn't experienced shame for my own offensive behavior. When I really owned it to the whole depth, because I, it was not good, but I owned it and I apologized. And what I was met with was like, yeah, that was dumb. It was grace and forgiveness and mercy. And that was the first time that I think that I experienced that in community and it's powerful. So that's what acknowledging our own offense, our own behavior looks like, but also the possibility of restitution and, and love, right? And there's daily examples of this that I could go into that when, during that school, but also like now, like there's just daily examples of being humble and acknowledging and not just thinking like, man, um, who do I need to forgive? But a normal rhythm is like, man, what have I done that I need to go seek forgiveness from people, right? That's a practice that we have to get better at as Christians because it's so loving and so life-changing. So practice of love number one. 
acknowledging one's own offensive behavior. Practice number two is giving up one's preferences. So after the school, came back to San Francisco about a year and a half later, moved into the, the tenderloin and the housing again. Luckily, I only had one roommate this time, so not four of us. Um, but soon after I had moved in, it was, I uh, was like, I don't want to live here anymore. So I moved out of the tenderloin. And I felt like about six months after I had moved out of the tenderloin, God was like, yeah, but I called you to women and girls to live in the tenderloin. And I was immediately convicted because I had been running away because of my idol of comfort. I wanted to be comfortable. I wanted to have my own preferences. I wanted my own room with my own bathroom and A, B, and C, right? And I realized that I was actually missing out on blessings that God had for me because I was bowing to the idols of comfort in my life by wanting to leave the tenderloin, by wanting to like pull a little bit of a Jonah and escape what God had actually called me to. And I'm not saying that everyone's called the tenderloin. We're not. Um, it's a calling. But what I am saying is that everyone has these idols of comfort or preference in our lives that essentially restrict us from loving our neighbor well. Does that make sense? So I want to ask us, what are some of the idols of comfort and, and preference that we need to give up today? We need to surrender to the altar. We need to say, man, I'm going to show up in community a different way with my, idol, or with my um, preferences surrendered to God. Another example of this, just in a really tangible way, um, just in a little, a real tangible way, my husband and I, uh, seven years tomorrow, up until this point, we have decided not to have children. Um, mom and dad, not saying it's never going to happen. It, have, it hasn't happened so far. Mom and dad are listening, whatever. So, um, but... <sighs> Oh, for a variety of reasons, two reasons uh, are prefer preferential. One is that we like sleep. It's true. One is that we don't like germs. <laughs> um, so uh, those two things go along with having kids, right? Like, am I right? But if, I'm, if we are not called to have children, what we are called to do is to be faithful aunties and uncles in the community of God. And to come alongside our friends that, like our brothers and sisters in Christ that do have children and provide family for their children as well, to be aunties and uncles in a really tangible way, this means showing up and showing up consistently. It means being at um, birthday parties and birthday presents and graduations and soccer games and bedtimes and all the things. That would, it looks like really tangibly showing up for people and free babysitting. Am I right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Amen. Free babysitting. And I'll tell you a, t a tale about that. The, w the way that I knew that I was called San Francisco and that San Francisco was home was at bedtime with a five-year-old that I was, that I had been babysitting for like for free, just because that's what family does, right? We take care of each other. And he looked at me, he said, Gabby Juice, do you love me? And I said, of course I love you. And he like looked up with me with these eyes and I'm like, man, this is home. I was changed because I was an auntie to, to sweetie. And it means that when little nuggets climb on your lap that you love and they sneeze in your face, you say, thank you so much. I love you. You're made in the image of God, right? Like, and so just like showing up, giving up one's preferences, really tangible ex example. And we are transformed as well when we give up one, our own preferences, right? Number three, forgiving. As Christians, I've said this before here, I'm going to say it again. Forgiveness is our superpower. It is a picture of Jesus' love for us to a world that doesn't understand what forgiveness is. And so when we forgive each other, that's a picture of Christ's love. And I think that that's why it's so hard. I think that's why we hold on to hurt for so long is because if we were to release forgiveness, we were to give up control and there's an attack on forgiveness. So I wanna encourage us, forgive. It's our superpower. A question I've been asking myself over the last several months is, Gabby, what does it look like to live in a way that you're unoffendable. And that doesn't mean that I haven't been hurt or I haven't felt pain or I haven't had to even have difficult conversations seeking reconciliation, but what does it look like to live in a space where you are unoffendable and that you don't intentionally pick up offense? And when you do, you recognize it quickly and lay it back down and then go seek re reconciliation. What does that look like? How different would our... Uh, reconciliation look like if instead of being, instead of one, waiting for someone to come to you to ask for forgiveness, right? I've prayed those prayers in worship. Lord, I just pray this one particular person would come to me and ask for forgiveness. I've done that and God does it. And also what does it look like that God give me courage to go to this person? What does it look like if I were to say, hey, Lydia, we have, we need to talk about some things, but before we do, 
I just want you to know I love you and I value you and I'm for you and I see your story and I see like how you've gotten, you've got to this place and I'm just so incredibly like blessed all the time by your kindness and your inclusivity and the way that you go after people. I love you because I love you. We have to have this conversation, but man, you're the best and I'm committed to you. How different would our reconciliation look like? Those conversations, right? Let's be a community where that's the way that we handle conflict together. Amen? There's so much hope in that. That would get San Francisco's attention, the way that we love in that way. Practice number four, this is a bonus one. It's not a Benedictine thing, but it's a bonus one because it's in the text. So in Romans 12, verse 10, it says, love one another with brotherly affection and outdo one another in showing honor. Practice number four, outdo one another and showing honor. There's like, I picked a different translation intentionally because um, in the original language, there's almost like this competitive nature to it where it's like, man, I'm gonna one-up you. I'm gonna one-up you in showing honor. Man, not, not in a weird way, but like, just like, man, let's go after this. Let's commit as a community. I love um, Andy, Andy, where you're like, I wanna honor Randy. Amen. That's how you build that culture is that you call it out. Even like... It's those decisions of being like, man, I'm going to see what God is doing in someone else and I'm gonna call that forward. That's how you build a culture of honor. So thank you for doing that. Let's give it up for Andy. And then Roman, if you go back to the text, Romans 12, verses seven and eight, uh, it talks about the gifts of the spirit that each of us have. It says, so if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak. If your gift is serve, serve well. If it's to teach, teach well. If it's to courage, be encouraging. If it's to give, give generously. If God is giving you leadership ability, take, it, take the responsibility seriously. If you've been a gift of showing kindness, do it. Let's not withhold from each other, but let's know that every single individual in this room is made in the image of God, deposited with gifts from the Holy Spirit, and let's bring them together. Amen? Like, what if we actually showed up with that kind of expectancy on a Sunday morning or in our growth groups or our women's groups or the different groups that we have here or belong night? What if we showed up being like, man, I can't wait to see what God's gonna do through my community today because that's why we gather together. It's not, that's the, that is the main purpose why we gather together is to be encouraged and be like, man, what is God gonna do in our community today? And I can say without a doubt that I'm standing here in front of you today because of the grace of God, but also because of my people, my family, the ones that have unlocked parts of my calling in me because they spoke, because they encouraged, because they corrected, because they were kind, because they gave, because they led. We actually need each other to unlock each other's callings. Amen? Outdo one another in love. Take the initiative. Commit to it and go after it together love each other genuinely, outdo each other, one, outdo one another in honor, because family matters, right? How we show up matters, right? Yeah. And, the, and as we kind of close, um, people are like, yes, that's great. I don't have that. <laughs> that's okay, that's okay. I wanna encourage you to be this person. Uh, a, couple, a few years ago, uh, Mateo and I, we had like, uh, we had hung out with this couple like once um, and then they gave us a ride home from church and they came to us. Uh, they'd stopped in front of our apartment in the Tenderloin, double parked, whatever. And they turned around and they go, we're going to pursue you. <laughs> and we were like, what? <laughs> and they're like, we don't know if you want to be pursued, but we are going to pursue you. <laughs> and we were like, okay, <laughs> cool. We don't know what that means. But we went back and we're like, God, what is happening? And he is like, pay attention. Pay attention to who you are, who is being, who is pursuing you, and also pray and ask who you are to pursue in that kind of way, right? And months later, we did have an intentional conversation where we were probably like, "Yeah, we're in. <laughs> like, I'm committed to you. We're committed to each other." Literally texted them this morning. It was like, "Hey, so great. This is years, like eight years ago." Texted them this morning. It was like, "Hey, preaching this morning. I just want to thank you for who you are in my life." And life has happened. They've left the city. Like, like, like circumstances. He texted back. He goes, "I'm so. Com we are committed to you. We know we haven't seen each other in a while, but man, you are it for us. That's the kind of covenant friendship that we have. You know. So life." 
life happens, things ha- like things happen. They live in Novato, it's not that far away. So, but, <laughs> but, but it's not the Richmond, like, but still, like, so, it, like, but intentionality, intentionality. And it only takes one person. So I think that that's what I love about Ted Lasso is that it took one person of daily, intentional, small acts of kindness, of building this culture that really transformed the entire team. How much more so can we do that when we are empowered by the Holy Spirit to love and like, it's like sanctioned by God that we live in this kind of community, amen?